We have a lot of information that I'd like to share with you today. And so I want to honor everybody's time because I know you probably have other sessions that you've signed up for. Um, so I am going to go ahead and kind of get started. I, I guess, um, yeah, I, I was in the keynote as well. So I can totally appreciate that folks are uh, trying to get as much out of that as possible, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I am doing this solo. I do have the, sh the chat up where I can see it. If you are experiencing an issue or you have a, a question and I'm not addressing it, go ahead and unmute yourself if you want to ask a question during the um, presentation because I have a, a lot of things I'm going to share with you and then we'll have some opportunities for some interaction with each other. But if there is anything that you have a question on, um, either place it in the chat or unmute and just ask it and I'll try to keep an eye on the chat. So, um, awesome, yes, all right, cool. And I would never want anybody to stop listening to the keynote, we, <clears throat> Dr. Tintian Kalo Kubales is one of um, the scholars that I follow very closely in, in her work. So I have learned a lot from her. Um, so the workshop that I'm sharing with you, the information I'm sharing with you is about culturally sustaining pedagogies. And um, we hear these terms a lot, <clears throat> but Sometimes we need to demystify them and kind of see how do they, <clears throat> excuse me, how do they relate to what we're trying to do in our, in our classrooms, in our learning spaces. Um, and I am going, I, as I start all of my workshops, I want to acknowledge the Yaktichu Tichu Yaktilhini Northern Chumash as the original, current, and future caretakers of the land and culture of the area occupied by Cuesta College. Cuesta is in Tilini, the place of the full moon, and I gratefully acknowledge, respect, and thank the Yatiktu Tichu Yaktilhini Northern Chumash Tribe of San Luis Obispo County and region. And not only is my campus located on um, the Yaktichu Tichu Yaktilhini land, but my home is as well. And um, I take, these, I take this land acknowledgement very seriously as a way of honoring the people who've come before me who are still here. And um, one of the things that I've chosen to do, and I encourage you to look into uh, if you, uh, when you find out about the land that you're on, is finding ways that you can actually contribute back if you have the capacity to do so. And so one of the things that I have chosen as an action is to support the um, National uh, Marine Sanctuary proposal that the Northern Chumash Tribe has submitted for the Chumash Heritage Marine Sanctuary. And it was put into, the proposal was put into place by Fred Collins here, who was the former chief. He passed away just a year ago and his daughter is continuing the work to connect the uh, marine sanctuaries between Monterey Bay and the Channel Islands so that there will be a continuous marine sanctuary to preserve the waters and the land that are those um, that have been and continue to be uh, those of the Chumash people. So if you're interested in finding out more, you can follow that QR code. Uh, and when we do these land acknowledgements, I feel it's really important to connect them to some sort of action or commitment that we can make. And uh, so I have found ways to support this. Uh, you can find out in your own community what, uh, what, what you can do to contribute to preserve and sustain the land that we're on. Very briefly, this is not a presentation about me, but just so you know who I am, I work at both Cuesta College and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo in teacher preparation uh, and also work with children's literature. And I have a workshop later on this afternoon that um, we're going to talk about representation in children's literature. My research interests are in how do we integrate um, critical pedagogy into teacher preparation. I feel it's really important that from the very start, we as teachers 
um, understand that our classrooms are spaces full of diversity and cultures that need to be acknowledged and invited in. And that that's what this talk is all about is how we can do that. So um, I've also been doing a great deal of, of research and personal education in ethnic studies for educators, which I, I think is a really important thing for us to all be thinking as if we are ethnic studies um, teachers, because we can be, we can integrate these practices into everything from preschool through, um, through college. So uh, culturally sustaining practices fit very well in with the ethnic studies pedagogy. So some definitions. I, the title of this is the what, why, and how of culturally sustaining practices. So we'll start out with what it is. I Before I reveal my definition of it, does anybody have an idea of what we're talking about here when we're talking about culturally sustaining practices or pedagogy? You can drop it in the chat or unmute. All right, well, I won't put anyone on the spot, but I wanted to give you some time to think about it. So culturally sustaining pedagogy, and this is straight out of the uh, foundational book on culturally sustaining pedagogy. It perpetuates and fosters, it sustains the linguistic, literate, and cultural pluralism as part of schooling for positive social transformation. And it exists wherever education sustains the lifeways of communities who have been and continue to be damaged and erased through schooling. And so what does this mean? This means that if we are engaging in culturally sustaining practices, we are appreciating, valuing, and uplifting the language and the culture of our students, not as a okay, it's uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, we're gonna talk about uh, the, the Mexican Revolution and then we can check it off a list. But it means how do I pull this language, the culture, the practices, the traditions, the knowledge of the cultures that are represented in my classroom? How do I weave that into my curriculum? And we haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this as a profession or education in the United States hasn't really uh, put a focus on this. And that's why it seems like it's new. And that's why as educators, either as future educators or current educators trying to do our best for the students in our classrooms, it's important that we make a conscious effort to incorporate these things into our practices. So you've probably heard of culturally relevant or culturally responsive pedagogy in the past. And that is absolutely where culturally sustaining pedagogy is rooted. And Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings is the person who we give credit to for identifying the importance of bringing children's ways of knowing and being into the classroom. And she has done a tremendous amount of research and has um, all the data to back up the important effects of doing just that, bringing in children's ways of knowing and being. What does that mean? Bringing in things that are representative of their culture, uh, the stories that have been left out of history texts, bringing in books where children can see themselves. Um, and so that's what we talk about culturally relevant. And then culturally responsive is something that we have seen a lot of work done on as well. And then there's actually brain research that shows how folks react when they see something that they can relate to in their curriculum. So these are both asset-based pedagogies, meaning looking at what do our children bring into the classroom. And thank you, Sharon. Yeah, pedagogy is the how we teach. Curriculum is the what we teach. That's like a super general way of, of, of term of, of defining it. But so when we're talking about culturally relevant and responsive pedagogy, we're saying like, what is the educator doing to draw in the children's culture into the classroom? And 
And so those are the foundation of culturally sustaining practices and pedagogy. Uh, also to consider as part of our conversation today is something that is called funds of knowledge. And what this is, and I want you to really um, kind of think outside your box here as what you think of as knowledge or information. And our US education system has this real high priority on English language, on it's not true if there's not a number to represent it on, it has to be written down or it's not a fact. And funds of knowledge, having this um, approach to understanding information is valuing other ways of knowing that may not be quantifiable by some number or some test score, but ways of existing and contributing to our society. For example, I have had students who are, um, who are farm workers and these students bring into my classroom in my community college classroom, so they're adults, they bring in all this insight into what food is available and how it gets to our table and what it takes to grow it. And that information for me in my classroom is just as important as anything I'm gonna find in a textbook. So as teachers intentionally thinking about how can I validate, how can I find out what is important to my students and their ways of navigating the world so that I can bring it in and show all the students in my classroom that there's more than one way to know or be. So if you're, looking for you know the baseline the foundational texts on these on these topics these are three of the really important books that are out there and what happens with culturally sustaining pedagogy is it takes the culturally relevant it takes culturally responsive and it's adding in the element of language really that's one of the biggest changes in um, the evolution of this. And you might say, well, what do Gloria Ladson Billings and Zaretta Hammond think of them, of culturally sustaining pedagogies? They embrace it, they promote it. In fact, in that book in the center there, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings wrote, Look up the ongoing evolution of what she started when she was talking about um, culturally relevant pedagogy. So um, that that's what I want to I want to validate that this isn't necessarily replacing these other thoughts. It is an evolution, uh, and what is really important for all of us is to understand that this is not some checklist. I'm not going to say there is one way to do culturally sustaining pedagogy because it's completely dependent on who's in your classroom. And it's really important that we base it on who's in our classroom at that time, not on how we've always done it from year to year to year. So it's not a best practice because there's not one best way to do it. OK, so it's a it's a promising practice. So that's what it is. It's bringing in children's experiences. It's uh, inviting trans languages. And I have some actual examples of it later on that I'm gonna share with you from a second grade classroom. So why do we need culturally sustaining pedagogy? I will say that as a, a child growing up and a white person, um, I had no problem finding myself in the curriculum or finding most of the stories about my history and I had the I had the privilege of of seeing my history being told. My guess is that there are a lot of you here today and there are the majority of the students in my classrooms today who haven't had that privilege and that is why we need culturally sustaining pedagogy because we know the negative effects of not having your stories told. And we just heard that from the keynote this morning. So um, if we look at textbooks and we look at teacher training traditionally, we see 
values of whiteness that are being normed and standardized. Everything is being compared to a norm of whiteness. And if we look at, I will say an example, is the textbook that I was given when I started teaching Introduction to Teaching at um, the community college. The textbook I had normed everything to English speaking, cisgender, uh, white people. And anything else had to be fixed so that it got to that norm. I'm not making this up. I have the, <laughs> I have the book. And it really blew my mind. Um, and it really amplified for me just how true it is. And so we need to present the rest of the story for our children. They deserve the rest of the story. Um, we have a very, we have all these terms here where I put these terms, learning loss, catching up, underprivileged, minority, apathetic. It, if you're finding yourself using these terms when you're thinking about your students, think about what's causing that. Rather than labeling them with these terms, what is the root cause and what can I as the teacher do to disrupt that? And that's, uh, that's culturally sustaining practices. I don't know how many times I've heard this comment. These parents don't care about school. They never come to meetings or conferences. Why don't they just speak English? Well, maybe because they don't have the tools yet. Maybe they're not at conferences because they're working to sustain their family. So we want to get away from this kind of thing, from fixing, trying to fix the student to fixing our practices so they can meet the students. Another reason we need uh, culturally sustaining practices uh, is to disrupt this ongoing common narrative that we have that everything is about the European settlers that came to this nation. When we know there were incredible civilizations here long before any Europeans came to this continent. We see history books like this that project um, enslavement as a cultural exchange. Um, we, or that completely kind of leave out important parts of American history, such as, I don't know, um, the boarding schools for indigenous children, um, Japanese internment camps, the actual impact of the mission system on the civilizations that were here. So we tell, we tell an uh, edited version of, of American history. Children my age and probably older and a little younger too, we learn to read and when think about when you're learning to read, you're focusing right in on these pictures, on these words. So my world was represented in Dick and Jane very well. But I can't say that for the majority of the students that I have today or that were even um, in, in my classroom as a child. And we look also at the books that we read. These are the um, these are examples of AP reading list um, books. And again, <clears throat> most of them have have a very strongly skewed view that, again, is through the lens of a white author. And again, our students don't all share these experiences and they need to be included in the curriculum. We have this color evasive behavior that literally I, as a, when I was learning to teach, because I taught K-12 for a while, um, I was taught you don't talk about race in the classroom. Well, if I'm not talking about race or I'm, I'm pretending it doesn't exist or I'm pretending my, I don't notice my children's skin color, that means I'm not even seeing my children in the classroom. So I, want, I, I think there has been a lot, of, a lot more conversation about this recently. Um, talking about race doesn't mean you're racist. It means that you're validating and appreciating the contributions of the different groups of people in your classroom. So um, there's this tradition though, and it's very well entrenched in teacher preparation. So let's, let's start unpacking that. And a lot of folks will say, oh, but there's, you know, there's, there's second graders, they're too little, they don't notice race yet. Well, we, we have actual data that supports the fact that babies as young as like two or three months do notice 
skin color and differences in facial structure. So no, they're not too young to talk about race. Now, children who are waltzing through on privilege, like I was, don't need to talk about race too much because it doesn't really impact me because I'm the one who's navigating the world without having to deal with those things. But I will guarantee you that young children um, <clears throat> who don't have that same privilege are, are having to talk about race at a very young age. And um, it's not like it's avoidable when it's something you're having to deal with every single day. So where better to talk about it than in a classroom with a caring uh, educator who's there for the students. Another thing uh, is that we've completely left out really important stories about our history. We only want to tell, you know, we only want our education to focus on what is perceived as the victories. And we have a hard time acknowledging the, the gross errors in um, in our history and the really damaging things that we've done to people that continue to have impacts to this day. So I've had students in my uh, college classes tell me they had not learned about the quote unquote Indian boarding schools. I have students who grew up in California who have no understanding of the Japanese internment camps. And as a child of California myself, I grew up with the fairy tale about the California missions. All of these we know have had a legacy of damage on, on folks. And we have students in our classrooms. And I imagine I've, I have participants in this workshop right now who've been affected just by these things, not to mention many of the other stories that have been left out. Um, so I, real quick, I would love to hear, um, and you can just put it in the chat. What is, is there something that you've learned as an adult that you wish you had learned in school? Like something that you wish your teachers had told you and just, you can just put it in the chat if, um, but I'm just really curious. Or maybe you just learned it just now and that's okay too. So as you're preparing to be a teacher or as you've been teaching, the GI Bill, yes, that, it, the, that is something I was an adult when I learned and that was very disturbing to me. And also women's suffrage, the colonization. We, we see colonization presented to us in this fairy tale way. I barely learned about the boarding schools, um, segregation of Spanish speaking children, into sped classrooms, the boarding schools for Indian children. All right, so the whole Indian, the whole um, extermination of the indigenous peoples of this continent gets really deep. Um, the indigenous boarding schools were a start, but the whole objective there was to exterminate entire civilizations, if you think about it. And the ongoing issues from that, the last boarding school was closed in the 70s in California. That means that practice was continuing through the 70s. And I always ask, what other schools do you know that had graveyards? So, I mean, like, that just boggles my mind when I think about it, that there, there were graveyards at these schools. Um, and also the adoption, the Indian adoptions are still going on. Um, and I use Indian and Native American and indigenous person because none of these words are perfect because they're, they're a really gross generalization. Um, yeah, so segregation, the segregation, actually we're more segregated now than we were before Brown v. Board. I mean, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack here. So these are reasons that as educators, we need to understand our history and what our students are navigating so that we can create learning spaces where they learn to understand why stuff is the way it is. I wish we'd learned about the Trail of Tears and the force movement. It's, I mean, it's, yeah, you start, 
when you start to learn about these things, it's really enraging. Um, no Child Left Behind and a lot of these reforms, yes, uh, the whole uh, No Child Left Behind targeted students like me, you have to pass every English test. Exactly. These ex IQ tests, um, these standardized tests, I mean, they're, they're, they're structured to exclude, not invite in. Um, and okay, so Landy, I'd like to address your comment about when desegregation happened, all the black teachers lost their jobs. Because when we, when we really praise Brown v. Board of Education, right? We say, oh, everybody's, it's all good. Segregation's over. Well, it really wasn't all good because what happened is the idea was, well, if we, if we um, get all of the, the African-American students into the white schools, that's gonna fix it. Again, norming whiteness as the, as the ideal here, um, which it, like who said, who gets to say that? The victor, right? Well, Bell Hooks, who is an incredible scholar and uh, author, she writes about her experience because she was uh, in elementary school when the schools were desegregated. And she talks, and I believe Ibram X. Kendi talked about this too, how when she was in school with her, her African-American teachers, her, the women who knew her, who knew her culture, who understood her and who challenged her, who saw her, that when she was forced to go to another school and ended up with a white teacher, she lost all that. And instead, this what these teachers had this deficit attitude toward her, didn't believe in her, didn't see her as someone who could succeed and who could contribute. And so I'm not saying segregation is good, but like I want us to interrogate our, our motive for that. Is, is our motive to assimilate? then I guess that's, that's achieving it. If our motive truly was to ensure that all children were getting the best education, it probably wasn't the best thing. What if they had invested in the schools that were already there equally? And I see Cecilia just brought up redlining, which yes, that is, a, that is one of the root causes of the legacy of underfunded schools. So we could go on and on and you're like, I signed up for a pedagogy. I signed up to learn about teaching, not about history. Well, we have to understand these things to understand how we've ended up where we are and how we can um, try to do some healing and, and some uh, and some better, better work. So the consequences of this colonized white focused education has been that born by, for the most part, our Black, our Indigenous, our Latinx, our Asian American, our students of color. And what happens is we see folks pushed out. So why do you say, well, what do you, don't you mean drop out? No, I mean pushed out. Because if we are asking folks to sit in a classroom and learn about their ancestors and how their ancestors were just victims, how their ancestors never accomplished anything. Would you wanna sit in a classroom a lot longer? So it's not right to say that these are dropouts. We've pushed them out. We've let students know from the day they walk in the classroom that they don't belong. And I'm not saying that anybody does this on purpose, but it's by the environment that we create. It's by the emphasis that we put on this old fashioned way of thinking. Um, talking about an achievement gap without talking about the cause of it. We, um, Dr. Bettina Love, who is a brilliant scholar, who I highly recommend her book. It's called We Want to Do More Than Survive. She talks about an education gap. And you'll often hear about this as an opportunity gap as well. Well, what created it? What created it was inequitable funding, was redlining, was segregation. Um, and keeping kids away from the, the resources they needed. Uh, and I failed to say that Monique Morris has a book and a movie called Push Out where she, she focuses primarily on black girls, but you can kind of take that as an understanding of how, um, how our children are being excluded from the learning that they deserve. 
it also leads to a wealth disparity. The redlining, I had, a, I had a person tell me, oh, well, we're done with redlining. There's no big deal. Well, there's this huge legacy because those neighborhoods are perpetually underfunded because those property values are perpetually lower than they should be. We actually see a physical impact. We see physical impact of racism on people's bodies that leads to high blood pressure and diabetes and things like this because of a constant state of anxiety, sitting in a classroom waiting for the teacher to yell at you um, or worse. And, and obviously I have a very dear friend who has a different racial and ethnic background than me, brilliant, has been told certain things like, oh, you're not a very good writer. And to this day, as an adult, does not believe they can write. And you know what? They're one of the smartest people I know. But we see that. And so as teachers, and especially if we're white teachers, we have to be really intentional. We're still going to do these things that contribute to this. But what we can do is recognize when we're doing it and try to mend it and not repeat it. So how do we build culturally sustaining learning spaces? Like, do I have to go learn a whole bunch of new stuff? Well, it's worth a little bit of an investment and I will sh I'm gonna share with you um, the work of someone else. And so I want you to realize this is not my idea, but it is the work of Lorena Herman who was part of the group that worked on culturally sustaining pedagogies with doctors um, Paris and Aleem, who wrote that book that I talked about at the beginning. So Lorena is a middle school English teacher, and she wrote a book called Textured Teaching, which is a framework that I'm going to share with you about how you can apply culturally sustaining practices in your classroom. Uh, Lorena and her husband also run a website called Multicultural Classroom. And folks, I will give you at the end, there's a QR code that leads to these slides and then all these links to all her sites are embedded in here, just so you know. Um, so she and her husband run Multicultural Classroom, which is an incredible resource for folks. She does curriculum design. She's on the National Council of Teachers of English on a couple of chair, uh, she runs a couple of committees. And you might have heard about her from um, hashtag disrupt texts. Uh, she and two other women uh, founded that and have started a lot of really important conversations about literature and who's represented. Uh, and finally, for EduColor, she is the director of pedagogy. So I want to make it very clear that the framework I'm about to share with you is not my idea. I just want to make sure you realize that this is the work of Lorena Herman, and I think it's so powerful and I really encourage you to get her book, Textured Teaching, um, so that you can do a slightly deeper dive. Even if you're not an English teacher, even if you're not a teacher yet, I really hope you'll read it because I will tell you that this is the first book about teaching that I got my hands on that I could use as a textbook that was not written through this lens of whiteness. And it's very apparent from the very beginning because Lorena, who is an incredibly accomplished scholar, shares her experience as a student and as an educator of color. And for those of us who are white, it is a, it is a really important thing for you to read. And for those of us who are not white, is really powerful to see um, I, have heard, I have gotten feedback from my students about how validating it was for their experience. So I cannot say enough, this is not my idea. I'm just sharing it with you and I hope that you'll find space for it in your, um, in your learning and teaching. So culturally sustaining pedagogy, textured teaching is what she calls it. And in the center here, we have culturally sustaining practices or pedagogy. And this first ring are the three values that it's based on. Truth and knowledge, our kids deserve the truth. Um, we don't want them finding out in college that everything their, their K-12 teacher said was just a story. It's about justice. What is fair, what is just for our, to make sure that our kids leave with a sense of justice. And, 
everything is done through love and community. And, and I'm going to come back to Dr. Bettina Love again, where she talks about if we say we love our students, we have to truly love our students, especially our students. And we, we especially have to be intentional about our students who have different lived experiences than we do. And we can't just say, oh, I love kids. What is it? Tell me what you love about your kids. How do you build love and community in your classroom? And the first thing in culturally sustaining pedagogy on, on this value is get to know your students. Who's in your classroom? And so these three things are the values. And then on the outside circle are the traits of textured teaching. It's flexible, meaning you don't always do it the same way. And if you get off your lesson plan, as long as kids are learning and you're aiming towards those objectives, you're still good. It's experiential. So I always think five senses, see, hear, say, sometimes taste, you know, cooking lessons are great for math, um, but yeah, you know, bring in all the senses, get their bodies moving. Interdisciplinary, like we have this, especially with the emphasis on the standardized tests, we feel like we can only focus on math. We can only do math now. But what if your math project time or your math learning time included some spatial learning or included some stories about different ways of thinking about numbers and math, um, or you tie it into a, histor a historical element, or you read a book about math? And most importantly, textured teaching and culturally sustaining pedagogies are student driven and community centered. So student driven is a big challenge because it means stepping back. And one of the things in American edu education that we see is teachers hold so much power. Think about it. We get to pick everything about the day. We might have this textbook over here that we have to use because the district tells us to, but how that gets presented, I'm in charge. Where my children get to sit and work, I'm in charge. So to truly be a culturally sustaining educator, we might need to release some of that control. We might need to actually ask our students what's important to them and build our curriculum off of that rather than trying to get them to fit into what we planned ahead. And then also keeping it community centered. And this is where there's a, like right here, these are also all elements of ethnic studies pedagogy. So keep that in mind that these also support ethnic studies education. And this is not a talk about ethnic studies, but I will tell you that these, if you practice these throughout the years or kids have an experience of these practices throughout their school years, they're going to find out that um, they're going to get to that ethnic studies class and not be surprised uh, and not have to unlearn everything that they had learned till then. And so on this slide, this is literally a picture out of her book. Um, and again, I have a link to her book and everything else in the slides that I'll share with you after this. Um, so these are just a little bit, this is just a little bit more emphasis on what each of the traits involves. So I'll just have you, I'm not gonna read all of them to you, but, um, and honestly, as a teacher, you might be going, oh my gosh, this looks like so much work. It's, I encourage you to think of it less as work and more of, as, more of an investment in the learning experience. Because quite frankly, if you approach your um, teaching with these traits and values in mind, you may need to do a little bit more prep outside of the textbook that you have, but the payoff in student engagement and student excitement and student learning is gonna way out, outpace any extra research you might've had to do on the front end. And it's gonna make your classroom a more smoothly running learning space. OK, so you're going to find that there's a lot less um, worrying about who's, you know, who's messing with who and because they're engaged. And uh, so now I want to show you some literal examples of this in action. And 
I might have a little bit of prejudice here because these are examples of things my daughter has done in her classroom with her second graders. Uh, she teaches in a classroom in Oakland where most of her children have um, mastered or are, are, are learning English. Um, and every now and then she'll just like text me out of nowhere and say, hey, mom, you got an idea for this? And we'll start talking about it. And then what she ends up doing with it is far beyond anything I could come up with. So one day she texted me this picture and she said, the kids, I just taught the kids how to tell time and now they want to make a clock. And so she went out on the playground and they, the children created a clock. And it's 1015, she met, she texts me, she's like, if you can't tell it's 1015. And I thought that this was such a great example of literally a very student directed community centered learning. She taught like, first of all, a lot of our children have a really hard time reading an analog clock like this, right? And so she's taken something that was really hard. This was not her idea. This was totally the kid's idea. And what she was willing to do here was to say, huh, I should capitalize on this interest. Took the kids out on the yard, they made the clock and they took turns being the hands of the clock. This is experiential, their bodies are involved. Yeah, it's dirty on the ground, but most kids, I don't know, you know, they're having fun. So they did, nobody had to do it. But she took their idea and expanded on it. And I don't think any of the children in this class are ever going to forget how to tell time on an analog clock after this experience. Um, and in the springtime, she wanted to honor farm workers. And so she's like, Mom, what can I do? And earlier in the year, she had spent a fair amount of time with um, teaching them about watercolors using the book, We Are Water Protectors and found out how much her students really loved art. And I said, well, you know, the Chicano movement has a lot to do with murals and activism surrounding murals. And she wasn't, I said, can you do a mural in your school? And they wouldn't let her. And I said, okay, well, what if you make a book? And so here they have, the children have each chosen some sort of produce. And Part of this lesson was about farm workers, about how we get our food. It was about reading books about farm workers. It was about looking at videos of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and other leaders in the farm workers movement. She's lucky that she's in a school where social justice is a focus. And so they had already talked about community organizing. And so they all painted a picture. They all wrote a sentence about their produce. And she created a book and not only a book, but it's also bilingual. So there's so much going on here. Uh, we're validating language. We're validating the children's choice of what they got to paint and how they got to, to represent it. They're learning about important people that are often left out of stories. And when you print a book, I don't know about you, but the first, like, I remember the first book I wrote, it was in kindergarten. It was about my goldfish. And that was really special to me. And I was, you know, it was a stapled together piece of construction paper. What does it tell kids about their funds of knowledge when we validate it by printing it out in a book? And she did this with like, um, oh, I can't remember what mail order. It wasn't super expensive. And here they have their work. They are scholars, they are authors. It's pretty amazing. And this is another book that they, they did. Um, I. This is based on a book called The Best Part of Me. Again, the children choose their favorite part about themselves and then they write about it. Um, thank you, Anne. Yes, I think they will, they will remember it forever. And I know there are a lot of um, teachers who use this book uh, and I think I have it in the references. There's, it's called The Best Part of Me and it's a black and white book and a photographer has gone and taken pictures of children's body parts. But look at what Becca did here with her students. First of all, they get to pick their body part. And second of all, they are writing an argumentative sentence. So they are writing a sentence that says, I like this because. So they're having to support their first statement with a reason. They're, she's replicated their own handwriting. So again, 
really validating their choice of what they wanted to highlight, validating, um, teaching them writing skills that they need, that, that are, that's a common core standard. And then having this book in the classroom, she also did, and I've also seen it in other classrooms where they put it up on the wall. So you can do both. Um, and this one, I think is, I don't know if there are, are children who shared in, in Spanish um, or if they're all in English, I'm not sure. Uh, this is an example of some translanguaging. And I think a lot of us have, uh, we're talking a lot more about translanguaging, about the importance of language development in the language that it comes most accessibly to the students. We've had a really long history uh, and messy history with uh, bilingual education in this country. And um, let's just say we need to honor the language that our children are bringing with us. And that's, again, this is such a core element of culturally sustaining pedagogy is, is language. And so you may not be able to see it too well, but these were um, for Mother's Day cards. And again, the kids really loved watercolors. Uh, when my daughter first introduced them into her classroom, she's like, mom, they, they've never used these before. So this is a really, this is a new skill for them and they're proud of it and they enjoy using watercolors. So all of the children were given the opportunity to express whatever they wanted on their card. And this one happens to be for a mother, but it was for any you know caregiver that they wanted to create that for. And they were invited to use whatever language they wanted to. And so this little one has used both English and Spanish. Some of them were just in Spanish. They were just too small for me to show you. So these are just a few of the things. And I'm bummed because there's another example I don't have in here. Um, there's a book by Jacqueline Woodson called Show Way, where it's a family memoir of, of quilting, um, of a quilting tradition that her maternal ancestors had. And what it was, was not only was it beautiful art form, but it was how they made the quilts that were maps for the Underground Railroad. So the blocks were symbols for the Underground Railroad. It shows the brilliance and the, the um, talent and the intelligence of, this, of these people who were so good at undermining what their, those um, enslavers were doing to them. And the way you're like, what, so what? Well, so one day Becca calls and says, do you have any ideas for Black History Month, mom? And she only gets to teach math, right? And I said, well, hmm, let me think. Oh, show way. What if you did geometry and the kids can learn about how shapes fit together, but you also read show way and you talk about family memoirs and you talk about the, but again, the accomplishments of this group of people. And by the way, Show Way is not an all happy book. It, it, it talks about enslavement. It talks about um, some death as well, but it also ultimately shows the resilience of this family and the ingenuity. And I'll be darned if she didn't take that one little comment from me and turn it into a whole unit where the kids ended up sewing with needles and thread. But using things like pattern blocks and you know putting different size shapes together. So how we can weave culturally sustaining um, pedagogy into our everyday actions, these are just a few of the examples. And I, I realize that this set of slides, I, I will add the resource slide. It is not in the one that I'm showing you right now, but I will add it in right afterwards. So anyone who comes to look at these slides, I'll have a full contingent of resources for you. So culturally sustaining teachers, we have to do our own work. Um, you heard me share with you that I realize I'm a privileged person. I realize I mess up on a regular basis, um, but I'm aware of that and I'm doing my best to address those things and to learn from my mistakes. A lot of us have this perfection thing where we think we can't admit when we're wrong. Um, and that's okay. That's, that's because that's a society we were brought up in. But what we can do is be aware of it and, and address it and disrupt it. So these are some things that I encourage you to consider um, 
and reflect on in your practice. These are just a few resources that I highly recommend. Again, these are linked in the slides. Um, so each of these should be a live link and you should be able to go directly to those resources. Liz Kleinrock has written a book called Start Here, Start Now. And if you wanna know how to do social justice activities with like my daughter's doing here with primary age kids, she's got some phenomenal actual hands-on stuff you can do. I suggest you follow her on Twitter and Instagram too. Um, so these are, we're gonna run out of time. So these are just a bunch of resources that I have found and I highly encourage you check them out. And I want you, um, I wanna leave you with this quote from Paulo Freire that whoever teaches learns in the act of teaching and whoever learns teaches in the act of learning. And I want us to like basically flip teaching on its head. And I want us as teachers to think about how much we can learn from our students and how important it is that even though we know we have this list of standards we have to cover, can we stop Hi everyone, thanks for staying on. Sorry about that. Um, my internet is not cooperating today. So um, I'm really sorry. Let me get, I was getting, I was gonna get the link to um, the slides, but I can't even get that at the moment. Ah, let me, that's the right one anyway. Um, so I really apologize folks. Thanks for staying signed in. Get this link, okay. All right, so I'm gonna just try to salvage this by dropping the link to the slides that I was sharing with you is in the chat there. So um, feel free to make a copy, um, use those resources. Uh, you can reach me. I'm gonna give you my Gmail because I'm starting a new job on Monday. That's my email if you wanna reach me, if you have any questions um, or wanna talk about new ideas and I'll add in those slides of the kids with the, um, the quilt and the book. But I hope that you have a great rest of the conference and I, I'm happy. Let me see if I can get to share again so you can get to that. Um, there's the QR code and there's a little tiny URL that I created for um, this set of slides. But this will be recorded. Um, and then I guess I have this survey. This is if you are able to complete, it would be great. But I'm having trouble. I'm so sorry. I apparently live in an internet valley. So this is a little survey that I have for me. And then one that if you could fill out for the Teach for the Bay folks. Um, there you go. So I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, if we have a few minutes. I can stay on afterward if you if there's folks who have any questions. Um, thanks for 
joining me. And Dr. Ren, did you say anything about certificates? Uh, if you, no, I did not. If you are interested in a certificate, please email me and I'll put it here again. Um, please email me and I can send that to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to answer questions if folks can stay. I don't have something right this minute. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy your next session. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Claire, I see your message. Are you still on? I am. I just wanted to wait to you and to say hi. And um, yes, I attended your workshop in spring and just very appreciative. And um, I know I have your email.